we've come across this yet, April. The divine economy. Have you heard that yet? Yes, it really is a theological term. Okay, I didn't know that. We've learned something else new. The divine economy. And it implies that while the managing of his house may well require certain exclusionary measures, those measures are not the divine oiko despotes, the householder, the lord, the master's idea of how to run a home. In short, I think it's only fair to import into the interpretation of this parable all the freight of grace. And would you say that? Yeah, all the, yes, I would say so. Yes, all the freight of grace and the leniency carried by the word oiko despotes in Jesus' other parables. Accordingly, I'm going to take the householder here not only as a Christ figure, but as a figure of some gentleness. I am not at all disposed to follow the usual interpretation and make him out to be such a tough customer. Now, part of us is going to go, oh, what about hell? Come on. There you go. Stand up and okay. how, how's the pot coming? It's coming along okay. Okay. I hope but I'll have to check it again in a few minutes. <laughs> all right. Start with two facts. Two factors lead me to take that approach. The general thrust of the imagery of the parable and the specific presence of the words Agurthe and Thyran, which is door. Consider the significance of the imagery first. What Jesus is doing here is very like what he did in the parable of the friend at midnight. He is painting a parabolic picture using nighttime behavior as his model. But in this case, he prefaces his parable with the apparently forbidding image of the narrow door. That image, though it is by no means an entirely negative one, unless we are going to make Jesus out to be a trickster daring us to do the impossible, this first door he speaks of must be seen as unlocked, an unlocked door, a usable door, and an open door. Nevertheless, when he begins the parable itself in verse 25, he seems to confuse the imagery. He sketches a picture of a householder getting up and closing a door. As I said, my way of resolving the confusion is to conclude that he is talking about two different doors. Otherwise, what would be the point of his telling us to strive to enter what he has slammed shut? Actually, actually I don't think there is any real confusion here at all. I think that Jesus used the word door in verse 24 as a variant of gate. See Matthew 7, 13, and 14. The narrow imagery could well have been repeated many times by Jesus with occasional alterations for variety's sake. But then I think his use of the word door suggested on the analogy of the friend at midnight the possibility of yet another parable. I, whoops, I need to get back to my... Okay, I hear the timer going off. Are you making any bread today? I smell something burning. Ah, yeah. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs> That's a perfect comment from Calvin. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Please feel free to comment on the aromas you feel coming out if you think he needs to add something. In any case, I'm going to pick up for Robert. Okay. In any case, the picture seems to me to be as follows. It's evening. At supper time. That's great, because we get to smell the food. Uh, the householder's been reading the Wall Street Journal, or watching the 10 o'clock news, and he's fallen asleep in his recliner. Suddenly, the clock strikes midnight. He awakes with a jolt, realizes the time, and gets up. A girthy rises up. And he does all the things he should have done earlier. He locks the door, the thyron, turns off the lights, goes to his proper bed. But on his way to solid sleep at last, he's interrupted by a persistent banging on the front door. That's a very rude sound in the middle of the night. He's interrupted by the insistent banging by a mob, a mob of people claiming to be his friends. They want to come in. What was another time when people were banging on a door for their very lives, but they couldn't come in? Forty days and forty nights, no more sun and no more light. Rain, rain, every day the same. Rain, rain, every day the same, and the water got higher. Okay, interesting, that just dawned on me. Okay. They said, we're your friends, Noah. Let us in. Don't you remember? We kept telling you, this is a stupid thing you're doing. Okay. Well, what might 
they want to do? Go to bed with him and sleep the whole night? Hardly. Jesus postulates far too hyper a crowd for such quiet behavior. Perhaps what they want is a chance to bend his ear with the latest gossip, or perhaps a chance to prove to the neighbors they're important enough to be let into his house at any hour of the day or the night. Whatever it is, it will be something based entirely on their concerns, on their convenience, their problems, in short, their lives. At any rate, Jesus portrays them. They talk like a bunch of selfish parvenus. After the householder's first snub, they come back at him with indignation disguised as bonami. But we've lunched with you. We've had drinks with you at the club. We even attended your fabulous lectures. Despite their social climbing cajolery, though Jesus has the householder tell them, they simply don't fit in with his plans. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know where you're coming from. Not I don't know you, interesting, but I don't know where you're coming from. For all he can understand of their idiotic lives and preoccupations, they might as well be from another planet. They certainly haven't the foggiest notion of how he wants to operate. Oh, Robert, good, because we're getting to the part I, I can't fathom. Now then, having thus extrapolated the parable, let me e exaggerate. Exegete. E exegete my extrapolation. Exegete means? <laughs> Just put her on the spot. Exegesis is, we all studied this last summer. What was there and what, then? What, what, it, what it meant, to dig into the meaning and really dig out what it meant at the time. Sorry. Okay. All right, here we go. Stage fright. The nap out of which the householder Christ figure rises. Stop for a second. We want to get that word, that nap. When you come to those words, really make them big. The nap, because they the nap out of which the householder slash Christ figure rises is Jesus three days in the tomb. Whoa, you got that? Okay, he had to rise up from three days in the tomb. The door he closes is the door to the exchanges of ordinary living. What does that mean? Exchange means that the the the, the things we do, the transactions, will not get us there. What we always thought. I mean, under the law, people thought. Under the law, I do all these things, and i got to do all these things. Not for my personal salvation. They weren't looking for personal salvation. That was not the, the, the hope of Israel. We all think it was. It wasn't. It was the hope that God would come back and restore to earth and restore Israel as a kingdom. That was the hope of Israel. We have changed since Jesus into more a message of personal salvation. And the sleep to which he finally goes is the endless Sabbath of the death of Jesus, which is the perpetual basis of the resurrection to eternal life. And what, at that rate, is the narrow door? The householder still left it open. Well, it is the remote possibility that instead of noisily insisting on their own notions of living, their way to salvation, they might just join him in the silence of his death and wait in faith for resurrection. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, I put down the recipe book while he was talking. Here we go. Okay. So, <coughs> please, um, Robert, where were you in the recipe? <laughs> oh, it's coming along. Yeah. Where, where, where were you? I let down my pages. The three? You finished three? Okay, so we're ready for page four. Okay, this is, you know, what they what do they say about too many cooks? Anybody? Spoils the broth. We have to be careful. All right. Um, so here we go. You just finished number number three. Yeah, okay. Oh, I thought you said page three. Okay. Yes. All right, is that forcing the original? Okay, so he said it might just join him in the silence of death and wait in faith for resurrection. Is that right, Robert? Yes. Okay. Is it forcing the original text? On balance, I don't think so, Robert said. He's not worried. No one ever gets through scripture without occasionally putting a strong arm on a passage. But he really does think that oiko despotes is the Christ figure. 
And because I said, I really don't think Jesus will ever close the door of grace, I think closing of the Aiko Despotes door, the householder's door, should be interpreted not as the locking out of the damned, which is what we think it means, right? Don't you all think that? I always did. Maybe it does. I don't know. We're just looking at one man's opinion of another way to look at it. Um, if it's not the locking out of the damned, what is it? He says it could be Jesus are, is closing the door of ordinary living as a way to eternal life. He rises out of his three-day nap in the grave and closes all other doors to salvation. Now, our Robert Farrar Capon, when he was Don Knopp, said earlier this morning, it's just so easy. It, that narrow door is just so easy. That's what, But it seems hard because we want to make it harder. And we keep trying to make it harder. He leaves us... Uh, but there's no other way to salvation except faithful waiting in the endless Sabbath of his death. I think that's an interesting phrase. I've never heard of anyone talking about the endless Sabbath of his... What is Sabbath? It was rest. Uh, yes? I have it under control again. Great. How's, did you, next time bring me a taste. <laughs> it, it requires a little more patience. <laughs> in the endless Sabbath of my hunger. Please note carefully what I am saying. I am not saying there is no such thing in Scripture as God slamming the door on the damned. There is plenty of it. And I am not sure, I'm not about to say that he won't. In the end, do something awfully similar. But yes, Virginia, if you have to know, I really think there is a hell. What I am saying is that this parable of the door it's not one of the places where the final disposition of the damned is being talked about. For my money, it's yet another grace parable in judgment clothing. It should be interpreted as gracefully as possible. It should not be used as an excuse to preach sermons on the tight security of the eschatological slammer. Right, I like that, the eschatological slammer. Eschatological being... That's it. End times. Okay. It's not an excuse to preach sermons on the eschatological slammer, and I'm sure many have been done on that. And that's just Robert Farrar Capon's take on this. But I find it, I, I, I find myself loving the idea of grace, and the, uh, the concept of grace for me just keeps growing. What confirms for me, he said, is, in that opinion, is the fourth of the Greek words he flagged. Croyuian or whatever, knock, the one with four vowels and together. In the book of Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Bigger. Knock. knock. Yes, I stand at the door and knock, knock. Who's there? I don't know. Uh, okay, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you see what he says about this parable? It says that while all the world's winners are out there knocking their knuckles bloody on locked doors of their lives, Jesus is knocking quietly on the narrow door of their deaths, trying to get them to let him in. Let's say that. To let him in. What is Jesus doing? Trying to get them, us, to let him in. It says, in other words, the exact opposite of what most people think. Not that he's busy dreaming up ways to keep sinners out, but that he's actively and forever committed to letting himself in. Let's say it. He's actively committed forever to letting him, for us to let him, uh, letting himself in. There we go. Don't worry, Virginia. That still leaves you a terrific hell. If they never open up and he never stops knocking, that's the hell of it. He is a bit irreverent. It says in short that this is a parable of grace, even though it manages to be that only by the desperate expedient of demanding to be stood on its head. You can't just take it at face value. You've got to see it deeper. On that last point, before proceeding, the parallels between the parable and the friend at midnight uh, are worth noting. In both there is a door, a siren, that has been closed by the householder, who in the case of the friend at midnight says, my children, my paedia, are in bed with me. Say it. My children are in bed with me. Who are the ch Christ's children? 
all of us. We're in bed with him. We're up there with him. Boy, that's really, that's as close as you get. We're in bed with me. I cannot rise up, Anastasis, to give you anything. In the light of where we have come in this book, that seems to me to say God's real children, those who trusted only in Jesus, will never get out of that bed. We can't get up. We're there. We're not leaving it. And it says that Jesus will never get out of that bed, since it alone is the root of his resurrection. Nevertheless, there is a rising in the friend at midnight, though the householder in that case will not rise up, Anastas, to give him to, to give to him because he's a friend, that is because of his merits of ordinary living, still because of his shamelessness, his acceptance of death is the only thing he's got. The acceptance, shameless. So shameless is the word there. Prayer, Calvin. When we come going, ah, not, not the publican, ha, ah, I thank God, or the, the Pharisee, I thank God I'm not like the publican. I've just been reading in another of his books a whole three chapters just on that. The publican, the man who was the despicable man, the man who cheated everyone, the man who wasn't going to change, he was the one. Because he came in that, in that position not saying, I have earned my way to you. Congratulate me. The, his shamelessness, his faithful acceptance of Jesus and his death as the way, the truth, and the life. It is a knocking at God's door with nothing to commend us, more to commend us than the door himself. Jesus is what will commend us. He will say, this is my spotless child, my, my brother, my sister. Uh, Robert? Yes? Can you leave your cooking for a minute? Yes. Sir. Thank you. My, my, my voice is dry. I need a sip of wine. To return to the parable of the narrow door, then, Jesus continues by having the householder say, after the second, I don't know where you're coming from. Get away from me, all you workers of iniquity. Iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, and yourselves, and you yourselves thrown out of it. People will come from east and west, and from north and south, and they will sit down to eat. Okay, thank you. In the kingdom of God, and behold, there are those who are now last will be first, and those who are now first will be last. Oh, hold on for a second. Okay, yeah. Um, you gotta bring me. You gotta bring us a taste before you're done. Okay. So, what is he saying there? Is this a parable of judgment or a parable of grace? Both. Who said Beverly? Don't ask anymore. That's okay, Beverly says it's both. <laughs> and yes, there are there are parts of both. And I never said it's all 100% one. But at that part, that part of it is the parable of saying that many, many will come. Billions will come. I look for a picture, like scads and scads, scads isn't a good word, gazillions of people coming to a, across the hillside. I couldn't find one. They didn't have enough extras in Hollywood. So, but if you can imagine what we were talking about when we talked about the world scene last week, that all these people, and my neighbor who annoys me maybe, and I pray my son-in-law, uh, will all be part of that. And the ones who will be last he has a different thing on that. That's a whole other rabbit trail to go down. This is the summation of the parable. Jesus says, those who, those who are knocking at the door of ordinary, plausible, right-handed living, power, all of them, mind you, good people trying to live decently, but nonetheless workers of iniquity, and maybe not good people, maybe bad people, doesn't, it's because we learned it's not good, about good and bad. That is the unrighteous that springs forth from the unfaith. Those are the ones banging on the door. The people. Good living is no more capable of justifying us than bad living is of condemning us. That's a big thing. Let me get through here real fast. Okay. Robert, while I find this. I'm back. I believe.
believe it's about finished, but it needs to rest and then we'll be served buffet style. <laughs> Only faith in Jesus, dead and risen, has anything to do with the case. And Jesus drives that home by citing specific examples of faith. A blind, even stupid, obedience to God who works by raising the dead. He holds up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the prophets, and he says that they will be the ones who are in the kingdom, while all the types who are trying to climb their way into the eternal social register will be out in the cold. Thank you. Last little bit. Finally, though, he says that I think vindicate, something that vindicates the frankly Catholic interpretation, right, the universal interpretation, I have given the narrow door. He says that people, the Greek simply says, uses the word they, will come, they will come from all over creation and sit down at supper. How's supper doing back there? Which means, as I read it, in the light of the finished imagery of the scripture, at nothing less than the marriage supper of the Lamb. The imagery suggests not a trickle of guests who after heroic efforts will find their way to some slow leak of a house party. We've all been to those parties, right? Uh, no, it's gonna be like the party Rick and I went to last weekend, 80th birthday party of a, a gentleman who was originally from Argentina and most of his friends, us except, with the exception of us, were Latin American. And they were mostly all older, take hope, my friends. That was the most rocking, dancing party I've been to in ever. Um, it's gonna be that kind of a party, joyous and celebrating and, and, and can't stop dancing to those Latin rhythms. True enough, they will be drawn through straight gates and narrow ways. <laughs> but they will be drawn by the narrow door himself. And they will be drawn inexorably. All they need is the willingness to be last. Think about off sermon. And lost, and least, and little, and dead. For by his grace upon their deaths, they will be the first in resurrection of the dead. I don't usually just read a whole lot. I've never done that in a lesson before, but I wanted you to have an, an, a partially because I was traveling this week and didn't have 30 hours to spend preparing. But I wanted you to just get a feel for the amazing Robert Farrar Capone's way of using language. Let's give him a hand, can we? Thank you, Robert, and may you joyously celebrate in the Supper of the Lamb where you now are. Uh, and thank you very much. And, and let's give a, a praise clap because Harry will be back next week. So let's all give a praise clap, clap to God for that and be praying for Harry. You know his situation is still a hard one as, as Audrey prepares to the, the last stages of, of leaving this earth um, and going back to be with God, her father, whom she loves dearly. So uh, someone pray us out. Who would like to do that? Matt, would you do that? Precious Lord, thank you again for uh, today's lesson, for time in your word, uh, for community. We do lift up uh, Harry and Audrey to you, as well as anybody else who is um, going through challenges, physical, spiritual, emotional challenges. Um, thank you that we get to uh, approach you in worship this morning, and uh, Thank you that uh, we look forward to the continuation of Lessons with Harry. Be with us now as we leave and bring us back safely together. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you.